Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images, voices and names of deceased people. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters throughout Australia. The Wathaurong people on the Bellarine, where sovereignty has never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We recognise the past atrocities against Aboriginal peoples of this land and that Australia was founded on the genocide and dispossession of First Nations people. We pay our respect to Elders past and present and acknowledge their continuing relationship to this land and the ongoing living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia. Hi, it's Peter, and welcome to Squatters. All right, well, I've been dropped off. Tonight, I'm actually on this little town called Bellarine. In the history books, it's been known as Bellarine East. But check out this little hamlet of, of buildings. You may remember last time I spoke about Thomas Sproul and his relative, the Browns, and they were from Borg in Scotland. Well, this little hamlet was set up to be like a replica of Borg. I'm about to cross the Port Arlington Road, which is a very busy road. I'm in my backpacking gear, I've already dumped my swag. The only people that can potentially see me are fishermen out there. So tonight, we're actually featuring a gentleman called James Conway Langdon, or as he's sometimes known in history as J.C. Langdon. It should be safe if I keep it stashed under there. He was the person that built what's now known as Spray Farm. The sun is setting, it's a beautiful night, and I can't wait for this stealth camp. So nice to be out on the Bellarine, while they're on country.
So yeah, just across the way there is Spray Farm. The original house is on the left hand side and the addition is on the right hand side. But uh, it's a pretty amazing house. Obviously that's private property and I can't camp on private property. I mean, 200 years ago it didn't matter. People just came and took it. But today, different story. I'll get in trouble if I go on private property. But where I'm going is down the end there. And it's uh, on Crown land. So the water's edge is Crown land. So the worst that can happen to me is if I if I get caught, the police will ask me to move on. I hope that doesn't happen. That's the whole point of being stealth, that uh, no one sees me. But anyway, we'll see how we go. the willy wagtails in there. The kid. They just follow me. Well, you tell all your ancestors that we're looking after your land. Uh, you can always tell humans have been here. What's this? Oh, what the heck is that? Oh, it's come from Thailand. Look at that. This bottle. Surely not. Surely hasn't come all the way from Thailand. But anyway, it's going to go into an Australian recycling bin very soon when I get my rubbish bag out. Yeah, a bit more rubbish. This is obviously closer to home, Gatorade. But I'll clean these up as I go. Anyway, this is pretty much the spot where I'm going to spend the night. Just down in here. This is where I stashed my stuff earlier. But right now, it's way too light for me to hunker down. But as you can see here, there's the fence. That's where the private property ends. And this, which is obviously manicured by that property, is Crown Land. So really, we just need to hope that all the residents up there don't come down. Let's hope they don't come down and find me. up on here sun is setting. I'm not going to set up the swag until it's dark. You know, just in case the owners come down with dogs, take their dogs for a run in the water or I don't know if they have dogs or not, but just making sure that I'm just a bushwalker. Oh, it's coming, but while we wait for the billy to boil, how about we learn a little bit about J.C. Langdon? J. 
James Conway Langdon was born in Bristol, Somerset in early 1806 and baptised shortly after into the Church of England on the 9th of February at St Michael's and All Angels Church in East Coker. James' father, William, was a well-respected Royal Navy commander and was involved in serving in the South East India Company in Madras and the West Indies. After being injured in battle in 1814, he retired and bought a merchant ship and made his fortune transporting wool and supplies for the benefit of the British Empire making regular trips and connections to Australia. William's son followed in his father's footsteps and just before James' 17th birthday, signed up to join the British militia. Once commissioned in 1822, he was assigned to the Light Infantry and the 1st Somersetshire Regiment. In September that year, the regiment was sent to strengthen the British forces in India. Before long, they were engaged in combat with the Burmese in the First Anglo-Burmese War. The task of the Light Infantry included advance and rearguard action, flanking protection for the British Army in forward skirmishing. They were also called upon to form regular line formations during battles or as part of fortification storming parties, providing a skirmishing screen ahead of the main body of infantry in order to delay the enemy advance. James fought valiantly all over India, remaining in India until he was wounded in battle in 1840. Before returning to England and marrying the love of his life, Eleanor Ellen Cookson, on July 8, 1841, at this parish church in Lyminster in Hampshire. Just one month later, Ellen, just 21, and James, 34, decided to start a new life together in Australia. James and Ellen set sail on the Alexander from Plymouth on August 21st and arrived in Port Phillip on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1841. On first arrival, they headed to the original colonial campsite at Indented Head, in current day St. Leonard's, where he set up a sheep run called Ellendale, named after his wife. Just a few months later, in early 1842, Police Commissioner of Crown Lands and experienced British Army militia leader, Captain Foster Fiennes from Geelong, was commissioned to stop the Indigenous uprising in the Western Districts of Victoria. Fiennes recruited the best militia, including men from the Light Infantry, to create storming parties to stop the Indigenous attacks. With the two decades of experience James Conway had in combat, it would be extremely plausible that he would have been drawn upon to engage in the attacks. The new colonists took the sacred lands of the indigenous and it was no surprise the displaced indigenous fought back. This led to a series of retaliation attacks on the squatters where there were severe losses of stock property and many of the ex-convict shepherds' lives. Losing sheep and shepherds meant the Derwent Company squatters were at risk of losing ownership of the land, because having sheep on the land meant legal possession in the eyes of the governing authorities. Port Phillip Superintendent Charles Latrobe ordered Commissioner Fiennes to squash the uprising. This led to the commencement of one of Victoria's most bloodiest, shameful and hidden moments in our short history the Umarella Wars. People don't really realise what happened in those days. <laughs> and if the truth would come out and people would understand what happened to our people, this feeling of sor sorrow and that, that we still got in our hearts when we, when we come to a place like this and see the desecration that's been done. And the way that the people were hurt 
sheep or animals. <coughs> Massacres must have been everywhere, not only in one spot. <laughs> Got my little treat. I um, actually suffer pretty bad from hay fever when I'm on the peninsula, but I find that the local honey from the local bees actually takes away my hay fever symptoms. So this is Bex honey, but this is only, I'm only promoting this because this is a local company, but uh, with the local bees, that's what makes it amazing for us here on the peninsula. I mean, Aboriginal people knew this, didn't they? They've been doing this for for years and uh, we follow some of their remedies and surprise surprise my hay fever symptoms go away maybe there's a lesson there for us somewhere as well as as well as coffee tonight I've got a cottage pie to eat this is in honor of uh, JC Langdon's wife Ellen from the, the ranch up there that they had uh, I'm sure they would have had a lot of cottage pies potatoes vegetables that's what they grew around here so tonight I don't think they would have had it quite like this but I'm gonna give this one a crack for that we just need a bit more water so I brought in my extra Kirk's water I mean I thought about boiling some of the seawater just for the fun of it but when I've got good water that's uh, fresh I think I'll just use that. If you think I'm a wuss and I should have used that water, well, let me know. <laughs> but for now, I'm just going to put up a bit more of this. Give this a crack. Mmm, that's so good. Yeah, he won't be able to see me from there. Mmm. Ah, oh, this is heaven. Well, I don't know if you agree, but this has to be one of the best squatting sites for stealth camping in the world. Okay. That is boiled. That's exciting. So that means we can start to get the work on this uh, cottage pie. Cottage pie is quite simple to, to make. So what, what I need to do is uh, I get this out. Ooh. Try not to lose much of the pie. So what I do is, so I've pulled the bag open, loosen the contents, sweet. Okay, right, done that, add water. Half a cup of water. I reckon that's about half a cup. So stirring the meal thoroughly. Okay, so let's get all the meat. Okay, that looks good. Now, we zip this up. Look at this place to eat. Look at this, we zip that up. And then we do the same with this one. So now I've got to add the water to the potato pouch. Let's just stir that up. That's pretty good. Okay. Now we've got to leave that. Get the air out of that. We have to leave that for 15 minutes. 
while we wait for that to cook, let's learn a bit more about J.C. Langdon and the indigenous of this area. Our people didn't tell us everything, you know, those sort of things. I know my granny loved it. She was only a little girl and her mother and her hid in the swamp. They must have seen a massacre. They, granny loved was saying that her and her mother hid in the swamp and they hid there until everything was over and that's how she, they got saved. Oh, there was hundreds of people died in the massacres. Which, there was massacres all over the place but they probably weren't recorded because they had a, a shooting board that they, they had with Aboriginal people. They went out and they shot them. And they come from everywhere to have this shoot against the Aboriginal race. And they shot women, kids and everything else. And that wasn't, you know, they wouldn't say how many they'd shot. They, they wouldn't put that down because it was a sport to them. It was like shooting animals. Fire at will! By early 1842, the frontier wars were in full swing. By now it was obvious that shipping thousands of convicts and treating them inhumane was causing a rapid moral decline in early Australian society. And now many of the ex-convicts seeking a life of freedom took up arms in Western Victoria as shepherds. Working for the squatters, these men had hopes for a prosperous future. But the immorality was a huge stain on this new colony and didn't reflect well on British governance. So the Empire decided to counteract the moral decline by bringing over respectable free settlers to help create a positive, balanced and Christian society. So an assisted migration scheme was established where the British gentry were encouraged to apply. James Langdon was amongst a third of migrants who came to Australia between 1830 and 1850 who paid their own way. Skilled migrants. 58,000 new respectable people came to Australia between 1815 and 1840. It was still no match for the approximate 160,000 convicts that were sent to Australia, now let loose on Port Phillip. The trauma of being a convict and the hope for a new future in Australia as a free person fueled the violence between the early settlers and Indigenous. The early settlers were even promised land as a reward for protecting and looking after the sheep. But the government's plan to make things respectable meant these new, respectable, professional, military-trained gentlemen like James Conway Langdon were now available for service in the region. Respectable people who could help with the region's ever-increasing hostilities between the early settlers and the Indigenous Australians. By June 1842, the Geelong Advertiser reported that a yeomanry cavalry was formed throughout the Port Phillip region. The Yeoman Cavalry were a rural district-based mounted volunteer militia force that the British used to bring peace and order to civil unrest. Because the colony was young, ill-equipped and unable to fund an adequate police force needed to maintain order across Port Phillip, it had to resort to recruiting volunteers. They'd used this strategy before to great effect in Van Diemen's land, now it was time to embrace it here in Port Phillip. The Yeomanry Cavalry, or the Port Phillip Volunteers as they were known, was open for all the settlers to join for the main purpose of protecting property and families. Now it was stressed that this wasn't to display military force, however each unit was under the military direction of a gentleman approved by the governor. So this was an official resolution issued by the Port Phillip government. The region was divided into 12 districts. The Bellarine was under Geelong as District 12 and the captain for the area was another squatter, Captain Fairfax Fenwick. He was to choose two more lieutenants of who James Langdon would have made a perfect candidate. The volunteers were trained, organised and commissioned as regular soldiers except not paid. The officer's role was to make sure all the volunteer militia had weapons and supplies. A magistrate's permission was needed to authorise any attack. So lucky for James, his neighbour was Thomas Sprout, the local magistrate, so he could quickly authorise any attack. We don't have any idea on how many Indigenous people were killed on the Bellarine, 
or Geelong by the Port Phillip volunteers, but it certainly makes sense why ex-military personnel took key locations around the Bellarine to take a strong defensive hold for the region. Whilst there isn't much recorded of James Langdon in the history of Port Phillip, Langdon Street in Port Arlington is named after him. We know that he went on to build his fortified red brick home Ellendale overlooking Port Phillip Bay, even with an enclosed courtyard for protecting the property and its resources from attack. By the 1870s, it was believed the last remaining indigenous in the region died, leaving a ghostly silence to a land that was once full of dreaming and wonder. I wonder, in James Langdon's later life, how he reflected on his life in India, then Port Phillip, then to retire comfortably and pass away in his new self-made town of Geelong on the 27th of May, 1887. Today you can visit his grave at the Geelong Western Cemetery, where he's placed alongside other early settlers, including the man who purchased Allendale off him, Mr. Charles Ibbotson. And then you've got down here Hobbs. Interesting. But despite the brutal extermination of the Indigenous Australians, many of the Indigenous Australians survived and passed on their survival stories. I know it happened all over Victoria that people were shot down and things like that. But here, I think, was the worst because the Umarilla War took a lot of, a lot of people away, you know, with, with fighting and things like that. But I'm proud of my people, how they stood up against the gun. The frontier wars on the Bellarine and Western Districts are mostly forgotten in history. But we must tell these stories. We must unearth these truths. And I hope these videos will spark up the conversation about this tragic stain in Australian history. It is just everything that I adore. Nature, beauty, serenity. It's just amazing. Look at this, all around, nothing. Look at that, nothing. All around is nothing, just serenity. Right, well it's starting to get dark now. There's literally no one around. No dog walkers, nothing. It's just perfect. Uh, um, I actually feel pretty safe, calm. Okay, that's been nearly 15 minutes. All I need to do is put all this into here. Mix it all together like this. Mix it all together. I'm about to have some of Alan Langdon's cottage pie. Here we go. Give it up. Whoa. Mmm. These meals are pretty great. Well, I finished the cottage pie. It's delicious. Now we better go set up the swag. Look at this sunset. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. Thank you, God. So, hiding it to make sure no one knows. Here we go. Grab it out. Pull it tight. Now that's the best that's been set up so far. Okay. So if, if anyone drives down, they're not going to see it straight away. I mean, obviously they'll see it when they get down here. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right. This is my pillow. 
which you've seen before. And it just self inflates. I think it's probably going to be pretty hot tonight. Not even have to take a beanie off. But anyway. Definitely need to put the insect repellent on. Now, in Australia, there's only really one option, and that's AeroGuard. And you just spread it all over the joint. That's a lot of AeroGuard, but I don't want these mozzies. See, they've gone. They've all gone. It's beautiful. It's a lovely smell, but it's better than being eaten alive by mozzies all night. Some stars starting to come through. It's amazing. I'm about to go to bed because it's just perfect. It's so quiet. But you could imagine here corroboree. You can imagine Aboriginal families here. Like it's just so flat. It's so perfect. You know, JC Langdon would have come down here and had parties down here and. And that's beautiful. But this little plateau of land here would have been perfect for indigenous corroboree. We have no clue about history here. Much of it was lost. All right, well, Let's get, uh, let's get this uh, ready for bed, eh? learning a little bit about JC Langdon we still don't know much but if you know if you can find out more that'll be great let me know if anything we're just starting a conversation and we're learning we're all learning about Australian history anyway I'm off to bed so good night well it's 1 30 in the morning and um it's so quiet. I just had a, a boat banging around and it's just left and just gone to check it out and then saw that the moon is coming up. Uh, it's not quite a full moon, but it's a pretty cool moon. Well, good morning. Well, whilst I anticipated this would have been one of the best sleeps ever, I've actually been awake on and off since 1.30. I got about four, four and a half hours sleep. And from 1.30 onwards, I woke up, something woke me up and then just couldn't get back to sleep. Then I just spent a few hours just gazing up at the stars and I saw some shooting stars. And in that time I had plovers, the birds plovers. They all came around the swag. And when they saw my head pop up, they were like, all started to have their little squawk. And you'll see when I filmed them, right then they all flew off. So I had owls, had possums, and this time I had plovers. Hooded plover. I wonder what the spiritual significance is of a plover. But anyway, well, how's this for a great start to the day? Looking over Port Phillip Bay, Cryo Bay, across to the Yu Yangs. The sound of the waves. 
This is what life is meant to be about, isn't it? Watching the sunrise. The best stealth camper leaves no trail. I mean, other than the dry patch where I was sleeping. There's no rubbish, nothing there. No one's seen me. No one's out there. Another successful stealth camp. Just gotta walk back up the hill, not just a little bit. And my ride will be there to pick me up. Anyway, let's go. Thank you God, we get to live for another day. Another day, another successful stealth camp. The scenery has been fantastic. The isolation has been amazing. And now my ride is coming. I've got to head off to work. So uh, take care. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends and comment what you've loved most about today. Take care, we'll see you soon.